So uh, Kirsten Weeks is a associate building ecology specialist with AREP with 15 years of experience in sustainability consulting. She champions the San Francisco office's net positive design initiative and specializes in integration of ecological function in the built environment. Uh, Matthew Williamson is, uh, has 23 years of combined experience in mechanical engineering and planning management design and construction of projects for both public and private clients. Uh, he's been working on water efficient building design and recycled water systems for the past 15 years. And he's currently an associate principal at AREP and leads their plumbing engineering team. So with that, I will turn it over to you two. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Ross, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, let's see if the technology all works for us here. Oh, you want to go back one? Huh? Do we need to? The uh, AIA course number is on this slide if you're keeping track of that. All right. Uh, we've been introduced, so we won't pause on here. So here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we wanted to change things up a bit and have an interactive session. Um, we are going to give a, a bit of an introductory presentation just to make sure everybody's on the same page about some background about water reuse systems. I'm sure it'll be old hat for some, but we want to make sure everybody uh, everybody's kind of uh, got the basics. And then we're going to introduce a, um, a design problem, uh, which is a real project that we've worked on in our office that's in design right now. Um, and then we'll have we'll ask people to kind of, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, group everybody by tables uh, since the earlier presentations needed all the seating theater style, but we're going to sort of group up as, as best we can uh, and work, in, w work with your neighbors to come up with a water reuse system uh, concept. And then everyone will get a chance to uh, share their ideas. And then we'll finally, at the end, present what we came up with uh, in our office for the project. Uh, so, without further ado, the background. Uh, so, there's no new water, right? Uh, we, the water we're drinking today and using today is the same water that was around in prehistory. So water reuse uh, is not a new thing. All water has been reused many, many times. Um, just, just to say that uh, there's no technical barrier really to being able to treat water of any quality to, uh, to uh, to potable standards to make it clean. Uh, the challenges come in terms of energy and cost and um, and uh, sort of just all the different kind of difficulties of of treating the water. So if you're if you have water that is uh, not so dirty, say like gray water. Uh, it doesn't take much to be able to reuse it for a use that doesn't need a very high quality, right? But if we want it to be cleaner, uh, it takes some treatment, minimal treatment. And if we want some very dirty water to become very clean, uh, it's going to be a heavy, a heavy lift, uh, no pun intended. So lots of treatment, lots of cost, lots of energy. So the traditional approach that we've taken to building designs, of course, is we put a connection out to the city, and we get all our clean water from our municipal entities. And then we just serve it to everything. So on the, on the right side, I have some of the different demands that we might have in a building. And what we would do is balance that by just providing a large enough pipe to meet all those loads. So the water sy reuse systems approach says, well, what can we do? Can we take locally produced recycled water and use it for some of the less higher quality water needs. So cooling towers, irrigation, and flushing fixtures. So that's what we're looking at. And we're going to talk a little bit more. And our charrette is about balancing those things. Right. So uh, when, when we first have a, get a, a project and we want to think about what, um, what are the sources that are available on site in that project that we might be able to use, so there's a whole range here, right, from black water, meaning the sewage, uh, gray water, which is just from uh, showers and hand washing sinks. Uh, by the way, this graphic comes from the water reuse practice guide. Some people might have been in the earlier session 
where they spoke about that, but this is a really good uh, brand new resource that can be uh, downloaded for free from, from that location over there. Ur uh, Urban Fabric and the Bill Worthen Foundation uh, led the charge on putting that together. So um, then we also have a source from our, uh, from our cooling systems potentially in a, in a commercial building. So condensate, that's really more in humid climates, the water that condenses on the cooling coils just out of the air. It's very clean water, but we don't get so much here because it's not very humid. Um, cooling tower blowdown uh, or, or, or you know, effluent from evaporative cooling. We do have that a lot here if the building has a cooling tower, uh, but it's not quite as clean generally. It's very concentrated. Uh, from being evaporated over and over again. Uh, rainwater, of course, from the roof, and then usually rainwater from the ground is referred to as stormwater, but uh, same source. And then lastly, foundation drainage. Some buildings, um, some buildings have water, groundwater infiltrating, and that water is also potentially available to be reused. And then uh, for what purposes? Matt already got into that a little bit, but we have a graphic representation. Right, so uh, w there are a lot of different places we can use that recycled water that we collect. Um, we can use it for irrigation outside the building, around the site, or planters within the building. We can take that water to um, the uh, flush fixtures, um, directly using it to flush our, the, the toilets or urinals within the building. And then lastly, and not shown on this, perhaps we can take that water to a cooling system. So using the water directly in a cooling tower, which is, of course, going to degrade the quality even more. So why use really high quality water for that? So what we like to do is just consider all these different uses and look at what we have in terms of the amount of water that we can collect versus the demand, which is the next slide. So in this, this is the same image I did before. And what we did, this is actually from a project where we calculated the height of each of these bars is that building's water demand for that service. So in this project, um, we had uh, a small flush fixture demand. We had a very large site relative to the size of the building. And we created this balance diagram. Locally produced recycled water, we had a limited amount we could create. And we were trying to figure out as much as possible, can we balance that with our demand? The municipal water, of course, it makes, fills in any gaps because it's considered the unlimited supply. Uh, but of course, we know it's actually not unlimited forever. So that's what we try to do. Look at balance the supply and the demand. And then we get into some of the artwork. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in, the, in the water reuse system, uh, there's always the treatment component, um, but there's also generally a, a bulk storage tank. And one of, the, one of the elements of designing a water reuse system is deciding how big that tank should be. How much water do we need to store? what's the right amount. Um, and there are various ways to go about doing that. So um, one example is if we're trying, if, if we're trying to, to collect water and, and we want that tank, that, that recycled water source, to be the only source for an end use, say toilet flushing, um, then we need to think about making sure that we have enough water that we never run out, right? We would always have a have a backup, a potable backup. But if if our our, our goal is uh, our goal is not to run out, then we need to know we need to size it to supply the the flow that's that's needed each day, um, and we need to bridge gaps in supply. So we'll show a graph of uh, that explains what it, what we mean by that in a second. Um, secondly, if instead we're saying well. We want to um, we want to get the biggest bang for the buck. We want to kind of optimize the the storage so that every every gallon or every cubic feet of storage gives us the most savings possible. Uh, then we need to do uh, we need to do some optimization work, which we'll show you in a. Sometimes graph. projects will have limited space, so we, we can't put a very large tank in. And so we want to look then at what is that optimal tank size that allows us to get the most use out of the system without uh, exceeding the available space. Right. So in the case where we where we're where we're trying to um, where we have a constant source and we just want to make sure that we have a we have enough for to meet the constant flow, 
um, we might do some. We might say we want to store two or three days uh, usage worth in the tank if we know what our flushing demand is for say two or three days, and our gray water source is constant. We're going to make that the volume. Um, if we have a varied source like rainfall, we might want to bridge the ant the typical longest period between two rainstorms. So here's. So sometimes we'll collect data like this is. Uh, uh, weather data from Singapore, which obviously gets a lot more rain than we do here, but uh, it's they have really good data. So we have the monthly weather data, so we know how much rain per month we might get. Then we also look at the monthly rainfall frequency charts, and this shows every day of the month how much rain occurred in that day. And we can use this to identify our longest gap. In this particular graph, our longest gap is here from the uh, 11th all the way up to the 23rd. So they had 12 days where it didn't rain. And so that might be something we would want to consider when sizing our tank. Can we, if we're only using rainwater, can we store enough for t the 12 day gap from that, from one storm to the next? Right, so if the rainwater is going to toilet flushing in that building, then how much, how much water will be used in the toilet flushing over that 12 day period? That's how much rainwater we might want to store. Um, so this is, this is, uh, this is a graph from a tool that we use um, that's more for that optimization uh, strategy. So this is, let, this is an example where, say, we're using rainwater uh, to meet um, flushing and irrigation, let's just say, for the, for the sake of looking at it. So what we can, this is how much of the flushing and irrigation that non-potable demand we can meet with the, with a with this size of tank, here's the size of the tank. So the very first little bit of tank, right, this is say 12,000 12, gallons, I think about that, is already gonna meet 40% of the, of the usage. And that's because the, the, as soon as we have some storage, we're able to, to, to capture and supply, capture and supply, capture and supply. It's a constant drawdown kind of situation. So we've just, we've got, we've got, got the ball rolling. Um, so we have very high returns for just a little bit of storage. When we start going up in tank size, we start to get diminishing returns. So we double that tank size to 25,000 gallons. And we just get another, uh, what, about 15% of the usage. If we multiply the size of the tank by about 10 from this first 40%, to 125,000 gallons, then we're getting close, but still not all the way to 100%. We're still losing some when the tank overflows in a big storm, or we, um, we may have some gaps. And then finally, if we really want to get to just to serve, to maximize the usage, we have to go all the way up to 150,000 gallons, right? So we've the just the bit to get from 95% to 100% is more than that first 40%, right? So if we were if we were optimizing, if we were going to our sort of uh, our um, our, si our our tank size for cost effectiveness for how much water we save per gallon stored, where do you think we would want to be? Anybody want to venture a guess? What would what size would you make it for that purpose? Huh? I heard number two. One or two? Yeah, it's you. I would say it's probably it, it's sort of somewhere between the two, isn't it? It's kind of the point where the inflection goes from going up to to going down, somewhere around the twenty thousand gallon mark. It would would be kind of the most cost effective or, or uh, tank size. All right, uh, and then lastly, just one um, one example. A lot of people here have probably seen this building. Um, this is just an, a local example of a system that's recycling black water um, for toilet flushing, and it also has rainwater harvesting from the roof. So it's saving a huge amount of water. We were hoping to, I, we were wanting to look up the exact tank size. We don't know what it is uh, off the top of our heads, but it's um, it's quite a small tank because you have this constant supply uh, of black water from the building, and then you have a constant drawdown, the toilet flushing. So you can get away with a fairly small 
uh, tank. It really only needs to be big enough to fit a couple of days of usage. Uh, and here's a schematic of the living machine. So those, these planters, when you go by on the street, these planters here are actually the, the plants the, uh, at the surface of a, of a constructed wetland, a flow through wetland that's doing the last stage of treatment. So we have, a, we, have, we have kind of the preliminary treatment, a storage tank, and then for, for polishing and, and uh, secondary tertiary treatment, the water's just flowing in and out of these tanks and being cleaned by the microbes on the roots. Okay, so the, the last point on this is again, is the more consistent your supply, the smaller your tank can be. Mm -hmm. The less consistent or less regular that the supply is, the larger your tank needs to be in order to maximize your use of that system. And this is a great example of that. I, it's a fairly small tank between five and 10,000 gallons. Um, I, I've seen it and it, it's, it fit in this room easily. So it's, a, it's quite a small tank. But again, it's because it's a consistent supply. It, the black water is coming right from the toilets, gets treated, fills up the, the, the clean water or clean water cistern, and then immediately is then used again uh, the next day. So small system, con constant throughput. All right, so, so that's all we had for presentation. Before we go on, do people have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my that one does have uh, a solids. There's a, s a settling tank uh, over here and a trash tank, so they do periodically have to address the solids on this particular system. Yeah, the, uh, there's definitely there are definitely solids in the system. So yeah. it's there's a sludge removal. Always it's happening. it's not very frequent. Mm -hmm. There's actually a manhole on the sidewalk you can see that goes to the sludge sludge removal section of the treatment system. Uh, so, question is, uh, if the plants die, would it cause spikes in BOD? Yeah, I think, I mean, the the roots are really acting as a substrate for the bacteria that are doing the work. So, in some ways, uh, I it it might it might still work if the uh, if the root uh, until the roots de biodegraded. Right, it might still work, but um, they do re they do remove plants when they die and put in new new plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any living system uh, does always need monitoring and maintenance for sure. Any more questions? We'll have more time. Um. You know, I'm not familiar on this particular project. How much water is lost in the process was the question. Yeah, um, so I'm not f I'm familiar with the precise uh, scale of this project in, in terms of their, their loss rate, um, but w I'm, they may have some of that information available at the SFPUC. The building itself, they have a very l uh, interactive display inside and you can learn a lot about their system in that building. Yes, yeah, there's always, all of these systems will have a backup supply of municipal, uh, either potable water or municipal recycled water. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you will always have a backup supply. You don't want to run At out. At least if you're on the grid, yeah, yeah, which in a city we we are. Yeah, it's not it's not permitted. Oh, sorry. So, where does the sludge go? Can it be composted? Does it go to the sewage treatment plant? Um, in theory, it could be comp composted, but in in terms of permitting, it's not generally allowed. Uh, human waste, com composted human waste. Right. In my yeah. understanding, the FCFPUC actually pumps it out to the sewage system to get to the treatment plant. They don't drive a big truck up, suck out the sludge, and drive it away. It, Oh, they do use a mm. truck. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, we we can always uh, on our we all of us uh, can always apply for variances to the code if we want to do something that hasn't been done or that's not allowed, right? So they applied. For, they they did a lot of work. Uh, state health department governs usually. Yeah, yeah. So they did a lot of that at the Bullet Center. They did a lot of working with their local officials uh, to to be allowed to do things that weren't weren't permitted in the blanket sense of the word. All right. So we want to move on to the exercise yeah. to actually get to some practice trying to decide uh, one of these uh, a system tank and kind of come up with some concepts. So. Um, what we have is a, a, the design challenge for you is a um, it's a 35 story high rise building. It has 250 apartments and 60 um, high end condominiums. The uh, apartments have an average occupancy of about one and a half people. The condos have about two people. There are larger units. Um, the building footprint 16,000 square feet and covers the entire site. So uh, this is a project located in San Francisco, and it is subject to San Francisco's uh, uh, Recycled Water Use Ordinance. So uh, we're going to hand out these clipboards with um, little elevations of the building, as well as some of the data on how much water we can get from the different sources. Um, oh, the challenge first. Yeah. So sorry, we don't have. We don't. We're not. We wanted to put up some compelling renderings of the project, but the client wanted it to us to kind of keep it on the down low. So uh, yes. you do have a building section in the packets that are being passed out, uh, so you can you can see the, the scale. So what we're, we'd like you to do, is your challenge today, is to develop a system concept that would meet the San Francisco Water Reuse Ordinance for this project. Uh, which is the goal of which, the requirement of which is to meet your full flushing and irrigation demand with, uh, with on-site water sources. Or if there's not enough, then use up your available sources uh, trying to accomplish this. So you have, yeah, just you, have this, um, you have this chart coming to you which are the, the actual volumes coming from the SFPC non-potable non water calculator for this project. Um, it's a table. If you, if you, you, could, you could sketch a graph of it potentially if you want to be able to visualize it. Um, I thought of that a little too late, so sorry for not putting a graph in. But um, basically, you have monthly, monthly volumes in gallons. So the rainwater from the roof, it's a pretty small footprint, and there are some planters on the roof. Um, everybody's getting these, so don't worry. Uh, are these volumes? So lots of water in the winter, not very much in the summer. Gray water volume, black water volume, which includes the gray water. Okay, so this is not this plus this. This is part of this. There's some cooling tower blowdown. Uh, and then these are the demands you're trying to meet. So you need this much water for flushing each month. You need this much for irrigation each month. It's very small planters on the roof. Planters, uh, I don't know if you can see the planters on the, that are kind of halfway up on a podium. Yeah. yeah, that has planters. The roof has planters. That's all the landscaping. Um, and then there's make up water to the cooling tower, which is another potential end use for the water that you might collect, although you're not required to do that by the ordinance. So if we can have people just uh, team up you scooch over to, to meet to, to get uh, to where you can talk to your neighbors and uh, go ahead and um, start thinking first about what water source you'd like to use and and which end uses you would use those for. Then we'll move to sketching how the water gets from the sources to the end uses. And finally we'll look at how big do we think the storage should be. So I'll go back to the first questions. You can talk about that first. And we'll circulate if you have questions.
We have a lot of people, so we probably won't all be able to present our solutions, but we will take volunteers. Uh, the first, I'm glad you guys want to keep working. It's really wonderful, but we have we do have to get through. So. Um, First of all, I want to ask, just a show of hands, how many teams decided to reuse rainwater in their solutions? All right, that looks like, what, three quarters of the room, something like that. How many decided to reuse gray water but not black water? Uh-huh, quite a few, quite a lot. How many decided to reuse black water? Oh, a lot of black water reusers as well, okay. Um, so could we have a volunteer, is, is there a team that did? Was there any team that wanted to use the cooling tower blowdown? Oh yes, sorry, cooling tower blowdown. So ah, uh, okay, 10%, we have some 15. cooling tower blowdown people too. Yes, thank you, I missed that one. Um, do we, let me ask this too. Uh, if you sized storage, how many have less than 10,000 gallons in your storage? Some really small, less than 10,000? Uh-huh. And how many had between 10,000 and 50,000 gallons of storage? Uh-huh. And how many 50 to 100,000 gallons? Anybody over 100,000? Okay, yes. One big tank here. Okay. So hold those thoughts. Um, can I, is there a volunteer who, to present a rainwater system? Is there a team that just did rainwater and wants to explain what they did? Maybe everybody. Are there any teams that just did rainwater? I won't, I won't make you present, I just wanna know. Okay, so nobody chose to do just rainwater. Can somebody explain why you did not? What, does one of the teams wanna, wanna explain why you ruled out doing just a rainwater system? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the other reasons for, did anybody, did anybody want to do just rainwater, but then they looked and thought, oh no, this doesn't make sense? Uh, yes. Unreliable water supply. So what do you mean? Too much variability in the supply for rainwater. Uh-huh. Okay. Good reason. Is there another reason? Yeah. Ah. Uh. It would have made, so if we had just used rainwater, it would have made for a very large tank, which is yeah. heavy. Uh huh. Good point, and expensive. One more reason. Oh, yeah, there was not enough rainwater, just period. If we look at the numbers, there's actually, the, the amount of rainwater is actually less than the flushing demand, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, how about a team that chose uh, gray water, but not any other? Was there anybody that did just gray water? Yeah. Do you want to? Um, do you want to? Maybe one of you stand up and explain what you did. The, where is the storage? And do you meet? Do you meet all your? Uh, do you meet your whole supply or your whole demand with the rain with the gray water? Excuse me. Thank you. I'll try to explain a little bit about what we did. We looked at the monthly demand for flushing and irrigation, um, and we got that's about 32,000 uh, gallons of water for the for each month if you take the maximum irrigation demand. Um, and then we looked at the total gray water demand, which is 102,000 uh, roughly per month. And so we were, we saw that with that we'd be able to um, supply all of our required non-potable demands with uh, gray water. And then to get a sizing for the tank, we looked at um, the total um, demand per day. And if we divide that 32,000, it's by 30, you get about um, a little over 1,000 gallons per day. So with a little buffer, we put 1,100 gallons size cistern um, for the gray water system. Right. And then we also found out that it's about 1% to 2% efficiency losses from the filtration. So that should be fine for both the capturing side and also the post-filtration side cistern. Yeah. Okay, is there another team that did gray water that had 
a different result that wants to share their uh, results? We have a lot of black water systems, I think. So how about, uh, how about someone who, who did a black water system? Do you want to talk about your solution? Anyone, raise your hand if you'd like to. Yes, you want to? Yeah. Okay, great, please. And actually the reason we didn't go with just rainwater really was that uh, there wasn't enough. But um, we, went with, we went with black water because we were concerned that when we looked at the piping that was involved that there would be an awful lot of extra piping for the gray water. So we'd have, um, instead of you know, sort of two headers there, we would have had three or more. So we, we went with that. And um, I just in general, I, I thought one of the cool things that, that our landscape architect came up with was to, was to take that, uh, we also used the cooling tower blowdown. And, and um, we decided that that would be good for some radiant heat in the floors. So, uh, you know, a relatively, relatively passive use, but, but we're going to filter it first. We're going to filter it. So, but we did have, a, we did have a, a, an MBR with UV and ozone, and, and um, we actually had two tanks. We didn't have one. We had a storage tank um, in the basement to, to help meter the, the pumping flow, the riser pumping flow, and then we had another storage tank at the top that would be rainwater, except in the sort of starting in July, I think, we ran out of rainwater and we'd have to have a, uh, had a rainwater tank on, we had a rainwater tank on the upper level, mm -hmm. yep, a 5,000 gallon tank up there, and then a 5,000 gallon tank in the basement. And they weren't really scientifically, but they're, that's probably about what it would be. All right, that's great, thank you. <laughs> All right, maybe another two teams of any system type want to share what they did? Uh-huh. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, we did one, one 20,000 on the roof, but which seems like now we think maybe it's too much. But we also thought that's for irrigation and uh, just for plantation. And then we did another one for gray water and uh, basement. So we mixed this together, similar to others. And the uh, basement one is like 50,000 or something. Big win. Yeah, some yeah. big number. So the big <laughs> one is, uh, yeah, bigger one is in the basement. Okay, great. Thank you. Other people wanted to share? So we have some similar strategy as well. We did um, one tank just for rainwater, and uh, we actually took December data, thinking that's sort of the most quantity you want to hold, and we have about 5,000 as well. Um, then the other strategy, the other tank is really for all the gray water, black water, and blow down to be reused. And we learned that the, those water could only be used for about two days. You can only hold it for two days. So we decided to be more aggressive. We hold it for a day, and uh, we size that down to a thousand. Great, thank you. And one more. We had a similar strategy too. We have two tanks. Ah, yeah. uh, no, it's, we're not <laughs> picturing anything there. Uh, so we have a black water storage tank in the basement, but we also thought of uh, having one common uh, storage tank for both rainwater and cooling tower blowdown uh, to balance the alkali alkalinity. Because rainwater doesn't have uh, any, almost any salts, but uh, the blowdown has a lot of salts. So depending on the month, uh, maybe we could minimize the amount of energy to like treat that water in order for it to be reused. You've got rainwater and blowdown in one tank. You also have balanced out the supply, the use of that tank, right? In the summer, it's mostly holding cooling tower blowdown. In the winter, it's mostly holding rain. So you're using it all year, even though the quality, as you've pointed out, is different. Cool, thanks. All right, any other, anybody else want to share anything or have comments about what they did, did something different? Yes. Okay, we'll show you now. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll show you what we did. 
and again, sorry we don't have beautiful renderings of it, but uh, but we uh, so we'll tell um, you the details. Let's lower the screen a little bit more. The actual design had to, of course, incorporate a number of things that we didn't ask you to consider. And one of those, of course, is the stormwater quality and quantity mandate is a state law about controlling the amount of stormwater that your site leaves. Because the building fully occupies the footprint of the site, there is nowhere where we can do stormwater filtration on site before we discharge the storm sewer. So we had to include a rainwater tank and using SFPUC has a stormwater calculator, we came up with a need. We don't need this water for the recycled water system, but we need it for stormwater quality. So we needed 10,500 gallons of rainwater storage and use. So we did that for the rainwater. And then for gray water, what we went with is a 7,500 gallon gray water storage tank. It is a little oddly designed because we're using, we're collecting only the showers in the building. Because we have hot shower wastewater, we are going to capture the waste heat from the showers and preheat the domestic hot water. And so we have this unusual tank with these, the heat exchanger above, the gray water storage tank below. Uh, we could, as everyone noticed, we can probably go smaller with this tank size, but we wanted to have some buffer capacity in case anything happens to the system because we will be getting rainwater, and when we get rainwater, we have to prioritize its use. So uh, the nice thing about the system, since we are meeting with rainwater and gray water, we're meeting 100% of our flushing and our uh, irrigation load and quite a lot of our cooling tower load with that. Um, we are allowed to interrupt any excess gray water we get on any given day. We can divert to, storm or to sanitary sewer. Um, so we can control our, how much gray water we take in by letting any excess just go to the sanitary sewer because we're more than meeting all of our required demands. So um, our system, it's a single treatment system where the rainwater comes into a storage tank here, gray water storage, it's going to, the gray water goes through the system, the rainwater bypasses gray water, it doesn't connect here bypasses it goes through the treatment unit. We then have a treated water storage tank where we keep one day's demand of uh, treated recycled water or as close to it as we can fit in the building. One of the challenges with this building is a very small footprint building with a very large program on it. It is 37 stories. Um, so we have limited space for tanks and things. So our treated recycled water tank is currently at 7,500 gallons. We're going to try to make that as large as we can. Ideally, we would have 25,000 gallons, which would meet all of our one day, or that would be our one month, actually. Um, but we definitely want to have the daily demand, but we'd love to get as much as we can because then we can do shutdown for maintenance of the treatment system without actually switching over to the potable water backup. So. And this is all in yes. Um, Parking, yeah. driving, cars parked by machine yeah. to, to, to meet that really satisfies the things we can pay for. Our, our the water system. It also means, you know, some if we put tanks higher up in the building, the higher up we put them, the more kind of torque mm -hmm. they put on the building. So it really increases the structural load. So it's yeah. ideal to have it. Plus, we can gravity pull all the water to the tanks if they're in pump the water. And lastly, of course, the higher you are in a building in San Francisco, the more valuable the program space. Yeah. And so nobody wants a big tank of water up on the 35th the roof, floor. The roof of this building is And then our last slide on that is kind of the footprint of the equipment room where uh, we have the rainwater storage tank, the gray water tank is over here, gray water treatment system, treated tanks over here, and then all of the various booster pumps to get this back up the building are over on this side. Can um, you also comment a little bit on what the treatment system is? I think there was a fair amount of interest in, in the treatment 
yeah. treatment systems? Um, so we're working with Aquacell to uh, use one of their treatment uh, skids. Uh, if we go back a slide, they have some of the components. There are, um, there are several providers. Uh, yeah. So Aquacell is just one. Yeah, so they have... Um, go ahead, go ahead. So they have a skid that provides, you know, with uh, the various filtration units, multimedia filters. Uh, I, I believe they use a membrane bioreactor within that. Um, and then final filtration. And then the nice thing about having the recycled water treated tank is that also allows us for us to do our disinfection, uh, essentially uh, a continuous disinfection process on that as needed. So. Um, Which can be UV or or mixed oxidants, chlorine. Yeah. Uh, I think it, I'm not sure whether this one is this one just is currently UV using, or if it's uh, no, it's using uh, uh, chlorine. Yeah, for now. The the rainwater is treated through the same system, uh, but it can tie into the system after the bioreactor because it is relatively clean. So it goes through a filtration, but then blends after the the bioreactor. Yeah, right. so the, the gray water goes through the reactor and then because it's relatively clean, then we mix the rainwater in there. One more filtration step and then it's uh, disinfected. The gray water, yeah, yeah. So the, the, because of the stormwater quality requirement, the only time we use rainwater is when we have it. The rest of the time, the system defaults to the gray water system. But since if we, to, to meet that requirement for stormwater, we, we can't even just hold the stormwater and then dump it later. We, we have to consume it within the building. So uh, that is why whenever there's stormwater in that stormwater tank, we have to prioritize its use. We actually have to drain down that 10,500 gallons uh, within a couple of days in order to have space for the next storm. So, uh, so you know, like last week where it was raining consistently, we would be constantly using the rainwater and then we would just divert, we wouldn't even treat the gray water we get, we would just divert directly to sewage. Uh, in the back. So as long as we uh, have that 10,500 gallons available for the storm collection, anything above, beyond that we can divert directly to the storm. Uh, if we don't have to treat it, we can just bypass the whole treatment system. <laughs> right. So. Right, so uh, you've all seen the numbers, right? We have 102,000 gallons a month. So that's about 75,000 gallons a month of extra gray water. And so the question is, what, what could we do with that? And so what we're, of course, is looking at is we're probably going to over-treat and create more water than we need. So we may actually be, you know, at, at some point we're going to end up with a full treated tank. We're going to have extra water and, you know, we don't want to waste the energy treating it, so we dump that gray water. So the question is, what, what could we do with it? So um, we try to work, and this is a relatively new problem the city is starting to realize they're going to have as these buildings that have these mandated systems come online. So when possible, it's great if you can couple it with a commercial building that uses, you know, like an office building. If you can uh, transfer all your excess gray water or treated recycled water over to an adjacent commercial building for them to use for their toilet flushing, you know, uh, Office buildings are kind of lopsided in the other way. Residential buildings generate a lot of gray water and have very little black water demand or flushing water demand. Office buildings generate very little gray water and, but have a large flushing demand. And, and the key difference there is showers uh, because we don't shower at the offices as much as people shower at home. And so um, balancing those two loads is, is the best way we can do to try to capture and use as much of this as possible. So we've been talking to the SFPUC about having them help facilitate different properties, create that exchange of this recycled water, and come up with an equitable system um, so that the building that generates the treated water is compensated appropriately for the building that's using the treated water. 
Um, another thought was working with the city to transfer it over to public parks uh, or other municipal uses. But so no, you can't send it back to the yeah. to the to the potable water grid the way that you can yeah, electricity. They're very no, strict about that. Yeah. You can't. In fact, we are. We're only collecting the showers because we have too much. Um, but the one of the issues that uh, the team here in the middle realized is that you're, if you're doing gray water and black water, you have extra pipe. And so what we thought was how can we optimize the system so that we have as few sewer risers, whether they're gray water or black water, in the building uh, and keep that um, cost down to pipe that. Yeah. The right. 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 The rule is the the requirement is that you meet your flushing and irrigation demand. So if if you can do that with less than the total, then you don't need to use all of the unless you can do you know it may still be a good idea if you can sell it to a neighboring property. Right. But if you can't, then there's no need to. But the other factor that we really wanted to consider though is uh, making sure that there's a consistent use in the building. So if we could say to everyone that came into the building, hey, your shower is going to the gray water system, it's generating recycled water. Every toilet in the building is flushed with recycled water. It's this kind of consistent sense. That is also kind of required. It's not necessarily as explicitly stated in the ordinance, but it is required that you have a consistent approach. So you don't have some toilets that use uh, potable water and some that use recycled water. If you have a toilet using recycled water, every toilet should use recycled water. Um, so they want that consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. So and I think we have yeah, yeah time for two more questions. Maybe there was one over here. Maybe three. Yes. <laughs> right. But currently the code requires that it is treated. Yeah. It's just for... It's a good point. I mean, there yeah. are there are places where there are certain, like Hawaii, for example, allows um, single family residences to collect their own rainwater and use it in their house without treating it. But there, it's the the idea is that there the public should be able to expect a certain guarantee of health standards, and so we have to treat it just in case there's some bacteria in it. Gravity flow to the tank, but then pressure. Yep. Uh, one, two. No, so I have one storm drain system, and all of it can go down to that tank. And then there is a maintenance diversion system, so they can switch it to go directly to the city if they have to maintain the system. One more, and then we we'll stay after if there are more questions. No, we we on a typical storm we would. Well, a typical storm here in San Francisco is a very small amount of rain, and we actually would use the entire amount. Um, the, it's only when we get really large storms, which are infrequent, that we would actually generate more rainwater in one day than we can store. Uh, yeah, overflows out of the tank and then goes out to the storm sewer. Okay, last one. So that's a, a complicated question to answer. So a good question. Um, so I, the I question was about you, yeah. If everyone heard that, but uh, just real quickly, the, the testing is required by the uh, uh, Department of Public Health or Environmental Health in San Francisco, and so they require a daily uh, uh, fecal coliform bacteria test. So that's a, currently a five-day incubation period. So every five days, you get the result of what happened five days ago. Um, and we are required to test that every day for the first 180 days of any new recycled water system. And then you have a permit to operate. Uh, and you have to maintain that system. And then at any point, if you fail that test, then they can shut you down. 
uh, until you've remedied that situation. Currently, the treatment or the testing requirement is very onerous. Um, and there are a lot of people working and trying to talk to the Department of Public Health about how to make that a system that's uh, more a cost effective and B, actually allows us to use this water. Yeah, the, uh, this, the treatment requirements are more onerous for black water than for the other water sources as well. So that's one reason, one challenge, one reason why sometimes people go more for rain or gray. Yeah. It's not quite as uh, stringent on the testing requirements. Okay, thank you all so much for coming. Feel yeah, free to come up you. if you have more questions. <laughs>